I'm Alan Wardus, and you're listening to Think Radio. Well, I think more women are speaking their mind these days and saying, this is what I want. And I think if that continues on, and women are saying to their physicians, I want to have my baby at home, that is going to be what changes kind of the history of midwives and physicians not working together. That's Marlene Bergman, licensed midwife and the owner of Prairie Love Midwifery in Gunnison, Colorado. You won't want to miss this great conversation about the ancient practice of giving birth at home and the benefits that can deliver to children and parents alike. Stick around for this episode of Think Radio. Think Radio is supported by the Gunnison Country Times, Gunnison's locally owned hometown newspaper, and by the Western State Colorado University Office of Academic Affairs. Think Radio is also supported by listeners like you. To find out how you can become a Think Radio patron, visit alanwardesmedia.com. That's A-L-A-N-W-A-R-T-E-S media.com. Marlene, I'm so happy to have you with me today. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. We've got such an interesting topic to talk about because <laughs> it's something that uh, I find very interesting talking about midwifery because, let's face it, for, for most of human history, babies were born where they were born. With uh, midwives. With midwives <laughs> attended by, um, you know, the wise woman of, of the community, and, um, and that's just how it was done. And so it's a relatively new thing to even talk about it as though it's something different. But before we get to the details of all of that, um, one of the things I'd really like to do is, is just to hear your story. You know, how does one become a midwife? How did you become a midwife? And feel free to just go back as far as you need to to, to help us understand the process that you took the yeah. path that you took to get to this place where you're so passionate about this this profession? Well, I think it all started when I was a teenager. When I was uh, 17, I had my first baby. And, you know, I came from a really religious family, and oops, I made a huge mistake. And the whole process of being pregnant as a teenager in, you know, Columbus, Ohio, and trying to hide from everybody... I didn't go to public school at that point. Mm -hmm. Um, Nobody knew that I was pregnant. My parents kind of hid me away until I had the baby, and I placed her for adoption the day before I turned 18. Mm. And so that kind of started the whole childbirth, like what is childbirth? What do people experience during childbirth? I didn't feel like that experience was what most women get to experience. And so to get through that, I started painting. And I ended up uh, finishing my high school at an alternative school where I got a degree in art. And Uh then actually I went to college in Ohio as well and got a degree in backcountry horsemanship and then moved out to Colorado where I was like, oh, my gosh, I need to be painting. This place is amazing. (laughs) So I'm riding horses and painting, ended up coming back to Western State College, got my BFA in fine art, and all of my art was about birth. Really? And I think, so, so describe that to us. We can't see it on yeah. the radio, but but help us understand what, what kind of imagery was coming out of your, your art in, in an attempt to process this experience. It was a lot of butterflies and tears, it seemed like. Oh. So like, I don't know, like it was all pregnant women and they would morph into butterflies. I think it was the whole process of being the maiden turning into a mother, you know, Yeah. and just my process of that. And then after, you know, I went through it, I got ended up getting married, getting pregnant, and I thought, oh, my gosh, I was not planning on having kids again. I didn't want to replace the child that I had placed for adoption. Mm-hmm. I, I felt like that's what I was doing if I were, you know, going to have another baby. But it just mm-hmm. kind of happened. It wasn't planned. It happened. And then the birth experience that I had, again, was not quite what I had envisioned Why not? somebody in a loving relationship to have. You know, it was just it, everything was told to me. I didn't have any choices. I... I was told that this is how things were going to be. and You're this talking is... about the medical profession. Right, yeah. right. And I thought there's got to be something more than this to birth. And I didn't know anybody that had a home birth. To me, that was insane. Who would have their baby at home with a midwife, you know? <laughs> That's what people think, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, and I did it. I had my baby in the hospital. And then after Prairie was about, I think she was six months old or six weeks old, we moved to Montana. And everybody there had their babies at home. And I was like, what the heck is this? People, Everybody's having their babies at home? Mm. 
you know? Why do you think that is? What was it about that community that, that made just, that more prevalent? I think that, you know, there were a lot of great midwives there and a lot of people living kind of off the grid. Mm-hmm. And people did not want the hospital or the medical professionals telling them how they were going to do things, how and when. You know, a lot of times birth now is planned. If you don't have your baby by this date, then we're going to induce you and this is how it's going to go. And if you, if the induction doesn't go well, then we're going to have a C-section and you're going to have your baby. And it's all great because you just get your baby in the end. Right. And I think more people there were of alternative thinking of like, you're not going to tell me when and where I'm going to have my baby. I'm going to do this on my own terms. Women have been doing this forever. I can do it just like they did. So I'm going to have my baby at home. And my neighbor was having her baby at home and she she started bleeding and she was probably six months along. And she called me over because her midwife was three hours away. She had passed this weird fleshy material and I was looking through it, talking to her midwife on the phone, like, I don't know what this is, but it seems like <laughs> tissue, you know. Come to find out that that tissue material was a polyp that she had passed, which sometimes we get on our cervix and sometimes they break off and come out. And... But not a medical emergency? Not a medical emergency, no. Like, I listened to the baby as best I could with my ear on her belly, and I could actually hear the baby's heartbeat, and her midwife talked me through everything, and and then her midwife said to me, have you ever thought about becoming a doula? And I was like, what the heck is that? Yeah, what is that? <laughs> so a doula is basically a labor sitter, somebody who sits with women while they're delivering their babies. They don't have a medical background, but they are labor support. So many people think that dad is all mom needs, but it's so amazing to have another woman with mom. It doesn't interfere with dad and mom. That doula can help the father figure out what he needs to do to help his partner along. Well, and once again, there we, there we go having a name for something that for a lot of history was just simply a function that the other women in the community played. Right. They probably wouldn't have occurred to them to call it something in particular. Right, it right, because that's just what, what you, you did. did. <laughs> right? But here's this woman saying to you, um, have you thought of being this? What right. was your answer? I was like, I don't even know what that is. I went home and looked on my giant computer, you know, because they didn't have flat screens then. <laughs> <laughs> right? It was a... Yeah, and found out there was a doula training in, in Missoula, Montana. Well, down in the Bitterroot. I think it was like 30 minutes from where we had lived. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I'm supposed to do this. So I signed up for it. I became a doula. And like I said, everybody in Montana was having their babies at home. And I got I got hired to come to some home births. Hmm. And I thought, after going to these, and even though my first birth experience was a home birth transition to a hospital birth transition to a C-section, I still was like, this is the way people should be having babies if they can. Well, the, and what set it aside for you? Why would you say that? What's When you say this... This is how it should be done. What things are you particularly pointing to? I think it was the fact that we were all in this woman's house. She was our main attention, and we were doing whatever we could to help her through the labor. There were women surrounding her, constantly uplifting her to making her believe, I can do this. This is hard work. I mean, having a baby is incredible hard work. But if you have people there going, I believe in you, I know you can do this, it makes it a little bit easier. Well, so what's the difference to the end result, right, uh, between that and being surrounded by medical professionals who've been trained? And what they're saying to you is, we've got this. Don't worry. Yeah. What's the difference between that, in your mind, why is it better to be surrounded by women who are saying, You've got this. I think because for them, once they get through the whole birth experience, they become empowered. They did it. They were the ones that did it. Mm. They were the ones that made the choices all along with their prenatal care. They were the ones that made all the decisions. And yeah, as a midwife, I'm a guide. I am making sure that we are staying low risk and that we are healthy and there isn't anything wrong. Because if there is, then of course we are going to go to the hospital. But the difference I really feel is the fact that they get to be the speaker. They get to be the one that makes the choice of their birth experience. It's not a physician saying, hey, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do this, and we're going to have this baby in a bed. You know, 99% of the time, most physicians are more comfortable delivering the baby in a hospital bed. And I have to say 99% of the time, I am not delivering a baby in a hospital bed. We're on the stairs, we're in a birth tub, we're on the floor. I mean... 
wherever that woman finds her safe spot is where I catch a baby. And it's generally not in bed. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's, from a medical point of view, that's okay. Right. You have found that there's no downside to that. Not at all. I may be uncomfortable, but... <laughs> yeah, you may be down on your knees. Let's jump back in time for a minute because okay. I want to tell you something about my teenage years, okay? I, referring to your story about um, your, your pregnancy and how it was treated and, and how your family dealt with that. I lived in a rural setting a block and a half from, away from an institution called the Methodist Mission Home, which was a very innocuous sounding name for a place where pregnant girls were sent Aha. <laughs> from all over the state. And so these girls were uprooted from their homes and sent to this place where they did largely what you did, waited it out and then gave birth and placed their child up for adoption. And I used to watch these girls walk back and forth in front of our house. They would go down to the convenience store and it just seemed like such an odd uh, time out in their lives. Uh, and so I have this vivid memory. So your story sort of, uh, you know, jarred that memory. I don't really know why I'm sharing that with you. I, I didn't have a question at the end of that. It was just my story. Um, but the question that I do have for you is being a doula then, you're a trained doula now, you go to your first birth. Was there closure in that for you? Did, did you find that that sort of completed in some way the story that you had started as a 17-year-old girl? To some degree, yeah. Yeah, like my story didn't have to be everybody else's story. You know, I feel like so many pregnant women, they their experience, they want everybody to have that same experience that they do because it validates it for them. Mm -hmm. And for me, I kind of had a different reaction. You know, I, I was like, they're, you know, I had Ivy, the daughter that I placed for adoption, I had her this way. But that doesn't mean that everybody else has to have her that way. There is a way that I can be there and help women become empowered over their birth. And to me, that was kind of like a whole new beginning. Mm, yeah, that's you know? a cool part of the story. <laughs> All right, so you're, you're in Montana, and I wanted to ask you about a, a stereotype that's often associated with midwives, and that is that they're a bunch of off the grid, I don't know, freedom loving, don't touch me, you know, don't tread on me yeah. kind of, you know, granola munchers. I mean, let's, <laughs> let's just go all the way, right? Right. <laughs> and there you go. You go to Montana and sure enough, that's the community you find. But talk to us about midwifery as a modern profession. Is, is that stereotype really true of most midwives and most people who would seek out a midwife? Or it what is, is your not. experience? It is not. I mean, there are midwives out there that aren't legal to practice. They haven't gone through the right channels. And there are midwives like that because there are people that want midwives like that. But for those of us that have chosen the path to become certified professional midwives and registered midwives, you know, I, I had to go to college for it. I went to the Midwives College of Utah, and I had to study there and get an associate's degree, which is a four-year associate's degree. Um, nobody seems to finish it in a two-year plan like mm -hmm. most <laughs> associate's degrees. I happened to get mine done in three years, but that's all I did. Mm -hmm. You know, I just went to school and went to birth and tried being a mom, but luckily I had a husband who was supportive. <laughs> so there are actually formalized educational programs Yes. For midwives. It's not are. just, um, you know, you sort of do on-the-job training. and Right. I mean, you, that's you a part of it. That. You can. You can do, it's called the PEP process. If you wanted to just study under a midwife, take an exam once you have your allotted amount of prenatals, postpartum, births, continuity of care, as long as you've gotten all of those things done and a midwife has signed off, you can take a certain test and not go through the channels of school. But I, I don't know very many midwives that have gone that route. Most of us all choose to go to school because there is some book learning you want to know. You know, you want to know where the baby's heart rate should be in between. I mean, we have laws that dictate that, but you want to know the reasoning behind it and why. You know? Yeah, and you can learn that stuff through an, an apprenticeship program too, but it's not quite the same. Right. It kind of sticks in your head. At least for me, yeah. it was better for me to get the book schooling route. Well, and I'm sure that gives everyone involved, the, the mothers, the midwives, the state, a greater level of confidence. Right. Would, right. would you say yeah. that's true? Definitely. Now, if you do go the apprenticeship route, 
how many hours is that? How many how many years is that? To... That's a good question. I'm not, I can't remember. I you know I, and I know that laws of the laws of have changed regarding how many births you have to go to since I became a midwife, mm-hmm. and they are making it more difficult because we needed more training, mm-hmm. which was really important. I feel like I think I had to do seventy five births as the senior midwife. I went to school for three years and did a three year apprenticeship. Um, with 75 the births. Yeah. Wow, that's a lot of time. Yeah, especially in a home birth setting. We don't, I mean, not everybody's having their babies at home. Uh-huh. So I was traveling from, oh goodness, I was doing births, of course, here in Gunnison, Lake City. I was traveling to Mac, which is on the border of Utah, going uh-huh. to Telluride. You know, I was I was traveling the entire Western Slope to get all of my births in. And it was the midwife that I trained under, Bill Dwelly, who's out of Montrose. It was his busiest three years that he has ever had in his practice. (laughs) So he needed the help. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And he had another midwife. She had gotten her license right as I was starting. So there were the two of them and then me. That we, We would have 10 babies in one month sometimes, I remember. I remember missing four. I remember going to four births in a row before I finally was like, I'm not going to this one because I haven't slept in four days, Yeah, you know? Well, let's back up just a second because I want to talk a little bit about the history of midwifery as a profession. Because correct me if I'm wrong, the, the United States went through a period of time where midwifery was home birth, an assisted home birth was illegal across the board, correct? In, in a lot of states. I, oh yeah, it was in a lot of states. It still is in some states. There's no amount of training, no amount of uh, of apprenticeship that will make it legal for you to attend somebody's birth at home. Right. Um, why was that? How did that happen? Um, and we're, we've, we're, we've already talked about through most of human history, that's just the way it was done. How did we get to the place where it became illegal? Because doctors started delivering babies. So doctors, you know, it was a, it was a money maker. I mean, it seems to me a lot of things always end up evolving around money. And, you know, doctors got trained as OBGYNs and they did not want midwives practicing anymore. So they kind of took over and I don't know how the whole process was done, but. Well, that, of course, sounds a little bit cynical. (laughs) Let's say for, for the sake of argument that the other side of that story might have been, at least publicly, that there were safety issues involved. How would you answer that. I mean, I'm, I've, I've heard that argument myself, Right. that right. having a baby at home is actually a very unsafe thing to do. And maybe that was part of the rationale at that time when it became illegal. What's your answer to that? Can you refute the idea that there is something inherently less safe about having a baby at home? Well, I think in some situations, of course, you know, it depends on the situation. If a mom is high risk, she needs to be having her baby in the hospital. If a mom is low risk, there is no reason why she should have to have her baby. I mean, it's her choice. But if she wants to make the choice to have her baby at home, then by all means, it's just as safe, if not safer, than a hospital birth. There's a less aggressive intervention. We don't intervene at home. We don't induce labors unless somebody's at 42 weeks and we're not inducing it in any way that is with drugs. We're only doing natural inductions. And... um, I'm sure that that things had happened in the past. They didn't have the same equipment at home that they have in the hospital like we do now. Now we carry all that equipment. I have oxygen. I carry blood-stopping drugs. I can suture. I can, you know, I can do a lot of the things at home now that they may not have been able to do at home when they were making home births not legal. Mm Mm-hmm. And most midwives back then weren't, I mean, they were trained from other midwives generation to generation to generation. You know, but also like when you look at the history, the medical history of how how doctors became doctors, you know, some of it's pretty gruesome. (laughs) Yeah, there were some practices there that we would, uh, let's just say we wouldn't do today. Right. (laughs) Um, All right. Well, what do you think was the cultural impact on people's thinking of criminalizing something like birth at home? Oh, gosh, that's a tough one. I don't know where that I don't know where that came from. To me, you know, to me, it was like it could have been a money situation there. Like, well, we're going to make midwives criminals because they don't have the medical training that we do. 
And therefore, nobody should be using a midwife because we are so much more educated than them. When in all reality, the history and knowledge of midwifery has been passed down from generation to generation to generation. And you look at other cultures that continue to do that. That's just how, you know, how babies came into the world and still do in a lot of other cultures. Think Radio is supported by the Gunnison Country Times, Gunnison, Colorado's locally owned hometown newspaper. Think Radio is also supported by listeners like you. To find out how you can join the Think Radio community of patrons, visit alanwartesmedia.com. That's A-L-A-N-W-A-R-T-E-S media.com. So there's still a lot of tension right now between the, the profession of medicine and midwifery. Absolutely, but there doesn't have to be. But the pendulum has begun to swing it because has. it's no longer illegal and it is possible to license to be a midwife. Yes. Um, what do you see in the trends, the social and cultural trends that give you reason to hope that the pendulum is swinging farther back toward empowerment and away from um, sort of the industrial model of childbirth? Well, I think more women are speaking their mind these days and saying, this is what I want. This is the experience that I want to have. And I think if that continues on and women are saying to their physicians, I want to have my baby at home, I want you to be a part of it as well. That is going to be what changes kind of the history of midwives and physicians not working together. People that are having their babies at home, if they want to have that medical aspect to their home birth, they want to have that physician there available to them if for some reason they did need to go to the hospital. That is going to be the only way that this pendulum shifts is people to speak up and doctors to go, you know what, I'm scared. I don't want to trust this midwife. I don't know how she practices. I don't know her. And that thought terrifies me because it all comes down to legality, you know. If that midwife makes a mistake, I don't want to be the one li be liable. I don't want to be sued for it. And that's kind of what has kept things, I think, apart in the past. But I think if people speak up and things begin to change, there are doctors out there who want to work with midwives. There are doctors out there who believe in home birth. Um, I've always said home birth isn't a belief, it's a choice. Right. But physicians <laughs> need to be able to go, okay, I understand why this woman wants to have this experience. And me as a physician, maybe I need to see what it's all about. Instead of just going on fear, I would love it if more doctors said, you know what, I, I don't know about you, but I want to learn. Mm -hmm. And I want to come to a home birth. And mm -hmm. I want to see what it's about. And I want to see what you do in a situation. Because not all home births go smooth. Well, that sounds like an invitation to me. <laughs> <laughs> it is. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I want to hear about it if somebody takes you up on it. Um, and so you're saying that you think there is reason to believe that that is shifting. There is. That more I, yeah. people are taking that step. Yeah, and more women are speaking out. And I think that that's the only way it can go. Well, let's put that into cultural context. Because we're in a season right now in United States society where that seems to uh, be the order of the day that women are speaking out. They're speaking out about um, sexual advances and advances and assaults, uh -huh. and they're speaking out about harassment. They're speaking about out about inequality in the workplace. Do you think that this part of that conversation belongs there in that same in that same collection of issues? Absolutely. And why? Because women deserve to have their babies however they want to have them. It's not up to anybody else. And in reproductive rights, reproductive health should all be about the women's choice. And we should get information from the doctors and we can get information from different midwives and come collectively and decide what is best for us as an individual human 
and not to be treated as a group. Okay, you have to have this done. You have to have this done. You have to make this choice. Each individual person needs to be treated as an individual, and each choice is different for different people. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that is a huge part of the movement today is being able to make your own choices. And do you think this movement that you refer to is fundamentally different now than it has been in the past? I mean, the 60s and 70s were a, a really powerful time of, of, of the female voice being heard more powerfully than ever before. Um, and this seems to be another, another manifestation of that. Do you think that it has real transformative potential this time around? I do. I mean, it did then. You know, there were huge changes then. It's just continuing on now. Right. Well, that's a hopeful thought. <laughs> so we've talked about the benefit of home birth and just generally taking charge of the process for women. There are other people involved, however. Absolutely. Let's start with the baby. What's different? What's better about a home birth for the baby? That's a great question. You know, I'm just going to kind of give some examples as far as baby born at home and baby born in the hospital. So when babies are born in the hospital, they are, they are trying to change the way that that happens. And they're trying to give moms more time with their babies right when they're born. But if you ever feel the towels that they dry the baby off with when it's born, they are scratchy and hard. And that baby hasn't felt anything but being in a bag of water. Mm. So... <laughs> I know that's kind of like a small little thing, well, but not to, to the me, baby, probably. Right. It made, you know, it was like I I remember at one birth that we had to transport and uh the doctor asked me to grab a towel and I threw it across the room and was like, This this is crap. I'm not trying the baby off with this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and grabbed one of the flannel blankets. Yeah. I mean, at home, the baby is immediately given to mom. I don't take that baby away. The cord is not cut. It's left to pulse. I never even cut a cord until the placenta comes out of the mother. And they have had some time to just be with that baby. So you can do everything that the baby needs, even if you need to resuscitate the baby while it's with mom. Hmm. And at the hospital, it's just, you know, it's it's the way that they've been taught. It's how they've always done things. They The baby is born. The cord is cut. They take it to the warmer. Oh, I was there when my first baby was born many years ago now, so th things were uh, probably less enlightened then than they are <laughs> even now. But I was horrified how fast he was jerked away and not just put in a warmer, but they began doing stuff to him. Right. You know, they poked his heel for some blood. I mean, within the first five minutes of I his don't do, life. Yeah, and that doesn't happen at home. I mean, if people choose to do the vitamin K shot, we just need to do it within the first couple of hours of the birth. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first hour is is best if we do it in you know within an hour after the baby's born. But I never, we never just take the baby away from mom and go do the newborn exam. The newborn exam generally doesn't happen until six hours after the baby's born. You know, <laughs> mom and baby and dad and baby get that time to bond. So everything's just a little more relaxed, is what it sounds like, yeah. unless there's a reason for intervention. Right. And if we have to intervene, we try to do it in a very relaxed manner. Lights don't come on. There isn't a whole lot of noise. You know, if I have to take the baby, the baby usually is still right there with mom with the umbilical cord attached. And we just have different tools. Instead of a warmer, we have a cutting board that we lay baby on if we need a firm surface to resuscitate mm. uh, with a, you know, with a heating pad on there. So the things are very similar, but they are tried to be more orientated in a way that baby does not have to be separated from mom. Mm -hmm. Has anyone done a, a study to track um, medical outcomes over the course of, say, the first five years of life? You know, number of infections, just general, general overall health comparing babies born at home to babies born in a, in a hospital. I am sure that there is some kind of study out there, but I don't know. That would be a very yeah, interesting be, thing to see. Be... If if having a relaxed and sort of a gentle entry, like you describe, would in fact have lasting effect. You would think it would. How yeah. you come into the earth is going to make a huge difference on people's lives. Yeah. You know, 
we always say peace on earth begins with birth. It's kind of a, I don't know who coined the phrase, but. <laughs> <laughs> and it rhymes. So that's kind of yeah. cool. Well, and look, look, I want to be very clear. This is not to say that there is something wrong with the um, hospital environment. I mean, for instance, um, we just had a new granddaughter join the family. And when it came time for mom to push, cord was wrapped around the neck three times. That was a case where everyone was very glad right. that C-section was available, they could get it done quickly, um, and the, the outcome was good. Um, so there's a time and a place for that. I mean, Absolutely. Yeah. And nobody should be judged on where they choose to give birth because it's their own personal choice. And for some people, the hospital is the place that they want to be. And for others, it's at home. And it would be it would be more beneficial to everybody involved if the hospital, not the hospital, but hospitals in general, because I've this hospital has changed from one end to the other since I've become a midwife. But if they would if they would be more willing willing to work with midwives and go, okay, I know you're here in the community, and instead of being scared of you, they tried to work more with you. Okay, what are ways that we can do if you have to come to the hospital that we can make this work quicker, faster, more efficiently, and more safe? Because mm -hmm. there are times we have to go. Are you seeing that happen? Is that dialogue possible now? Yeah, it has begun. And it's due to, we have some great nursing staff over at our Gunnison Hospital, and they have kind of helped lead the way of trying to get us to be able to work together better. Because mm -hmm. it's not always been good. Right. You know, and, and it's it's getting there. It's much easier to transport somebody there now and to be able to say, hey, this is what's going on and to be believed. I mean, there was a time and place where I could say, hey, well, you need to get a, a team ready. This is going to be a C-section. We need to get there right now. And nobody would listen, hmm. you know, to now where I think they might not have everything ready because things do take time, but they're at least going to be listening yeah. Well, yeah. that's a that's a step in the right direction. That's a huge step. <laughs> well, for one thing, it it's more in keeping with the spirit of a community. Mm -hmm. Rather than uh, working in silos, um, you're, you're able to form these relationships, and that's right. always a positive thing. Yeah. All right. Well, there was one more person that I wanted to uh, bring into the fold with a home birth. You mentioned briefly, but what about dad? Dad's a huge part of it. What does dad experience? at a birth at home. Yeah, I mean, for every dad, of course, it's different, but part of the whole process is getting dad to be involved, you know, um, and most dads are. There are some dads that just, they don't know what to do, and so my role as a midwife is to help them figure out what to do. You know, my experience, at least men in general wanna help. They wanna fix things, they wanna make it easier. Well, I will say, this is a perspective that you don't often hear unless you're sitting around talking with some guys who are, you know, willing to be honest, watching your partner be in that level of pain is one of the most terrifying things that oh, a man yeah. ever experiences. And so to be shoved to the side during that is not helpful at all. So I'm, I'm pleased to hear that you say your part of your role is to bring him in, make him comfortable, help him see what's going on. And to explain to him, if, if it's their first baby, he's never seen anything like this before. You can watch 100 movies, but you're not experiencing it <laughs> no, yourself. No, that's true. So to be able to tell that father during the process, hey, try this. This is going to help her. And also, by the way, how are you doing? Can I get you a glass of water? Have Wait, you peed in eight hours? Are you saying that matters? <laughs> Very much so. <laughs> <laughs> and And I want you to know that your wife right now or partner, whatever – you know, she's safe. She's safe and everything's fine because I'm monitoring that. And I can tell you right now that everything is going well, although it may not sound like it to you. And well, and it definitely does not sound <laughs> yeah. like things are going well. And I think that's one thing that's kind of gotten lost in the hospital is, you know, it's it's their job. It's something they do every single day. So mm -hmm. to them, birth isn't, you know, it's it's they don't see it from the, the partner's perspective of like, what the heck is going on? This is kind of scary. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Because there's all kinds of noises that come out, you know? I mean, people growl and moan and... But here's part of the point. They've been growling and moaning and clawing and screaming for hundreds of thousands of years. We're here at all. 
because that's what it's like. Yeah. And we we do it. Yeah. And sometimes, look, sometimes tragic things happen. Very true. Very true. It's one of those things we don't we don't know everything that's going on. There can be things that going on that we are unaware of. And that's true in the hospital too. Oh, absolutely. Anywhere. I mean, yeah. birth is birth is not a this is how it goes 100% of the time. There's not a manual. <laughs> no, no, sometimes it would be nice if there was. <laughs> yeah. But monitoring is the one thing that we all do, both at home and in the hospital, and we monitor super closely to make sure that things are going well. Mm-hmm. So there's a couple in Gunnison, just found out they're pregnant. They're trying to decide. They kind of have this feeling like, ooh, wouldn't it kind of be cool to have this baby at home? What are the top five things you would say to somebody like that to help them decide? Oh, yeah. How comfortable are you doing this at home? Of course, if it's your first baby, you're going to be a little scared, and that's normal. But do you 100% believe in yourself? Do you want to have this experience at home? Do you want to be the one that is taking charge of your birth? I mean, that's the biggest thing, because you are the one ultimately in charge of your experience, and I am just a guide. Uh huh. So some people might honestly look at that and say, uh, no. I don't want to be that responsible. And that's, that's probably the most common reason people would choose to not have a home birth. I don't want to be responsible. I want somebody else to deal with the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And that's fine. I mean, they... Because you're not offering to be that responsible person as the midwife, right? Right, right. You're and saying, I'm here to facilitate your responsibility. Right. And I'm here to be your guide and let you know if things are not going the way they should go. Mm-hmm. And to make you know the call to say, okay, you are no longer eligible to have a home birth and you need to have your baby in the hospital now. But ultimately, if there's something going on, you need to make me aware of it. Mm-hmm. I can't. I'm not inside you. <laughs> I don't know what's going on all the time. Right. You know, and it has to be a whole lot of communication. Are you willing to talk to me about every little thing that you're feeling so that I can ensure that you are continuing to be safe in your pregnancy? Right. Well, so what else? What else would you tell people? So, um, you know, one of the other things is, are, are you comfortable with taking care of yourself after the baby's born? So I'm not, you know, you're not in the hospital. You don't have somebody coming into your room for two days taking care of you. I'm back at 24 hours and I'm back at day three, but I'm only there for, you know, an hour or two. Mm -hmm. So are you comfortable taking care of yourself or is your partner comfortable in taking care of you? Cooking, cleaning, making sure that you get to the bathroom. You know, some people get really dizzy after pregnancies, regardless of if they've lost a lot of blood or not. Some people are just fainters. So they need to be monitored (laughs) when they go to the bathroom or Mm -hmm. if they have lost extra blood, they definitely need somebody to walk with them to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. You know, are you willing to do that on your own? So it sounds to me like if people could say yes to those questions, both of them, um, that would be a very empowering thing. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a little like, I don't know, this is a lame example, but riding the scariest zip line you can possibly imagine. You know, you climb up the pole, you're already out of your comfort zone, you get out onto the little platform, you clip in, the guy says, off you go, (laughs) and it's just you. Right. Can I do this? Terrifying. Yeah. But when you get to the other side, you're like, that was awesome. (laughs) I did it. Yeah. I mean, it changes people's lives. I've watched women whose lives have been completely changed just by their birth. Let's talk about that. Describe it. What what changes are you talking about? You know, from becoming a, the maiden to the mother, you know, it's a huge transformation. Hmm. You know, you go from not having children to have gone through this experience of having children. And I feel like society in our day doesn't really make that big of a deal about it. Oh, you had a baby. You're a mom now. See ya. You know? Yeah, back to work, basically, right, is what, right. what we say. And it, that needs to be celebrated. You just accomplished. You grew a human inside of your body, and then you got it out of your body. <laughs> well, yeah, cultures across the world through time saw that as an incredibly magical and mystical passage. Absolutely. What happened? How come we don't I don't know do what happened. Anymore? I don't know. But... Look, the point is, we may not do it collectively very well anymore, but people can do it for themselves. Yes. Yeah. That's a hopeful thought. (laughs) And it's pretty amazing to watch. 
You know, I'd have to say probably the best thing about being a midwife is that first acknowledgement when mom looks at her baby, the <laughs> yeah. moment the baby's been born. And you see it in the hospital. You know, I'm not saying that moms that haven't given birth at home don't have this experience, but it just seems so much more pronounced in the home births that I've been to. You know, that this is just at one second, just that first look is just this huge transformation. Mm, yeah. And it happens in a safe space, in a non-industrial space. Right. That's quiet and yeah, full of love. <laughs> <laughs> well, and again, I want to go back and say that I, I really do honor the efforts of really well-meaning and thoughtful and philosophical people in the medical profession that are doing their best to bring that experience into the hospital environment. Oh, absolutely. Um, so, I, you know, I think this is a story that it's not an either or necessarily. As you've pointed out, some people will always want to have their baby in the hospital. The question is, can that also become the kind of beginning that we want for our children? Oh my gosh, it absolutely could. I mean, that is like my dream to be able to come into the hospital as a home birth midwife and say, all right, I'm doing all the births for three months and you guys are going to see what happens mm. in this three month period. <laughs> you know, just give me hospital privileges for three months and observe it. And you guys are going to make a huge transformation into what birth can be in a hospital. You know, I want to make that documentary film. I want to follow you every day of those three months and see what happens. That would be very I mean, that would be amazing. I would love to do that. Yeah. Because I do think that women can have that experience in a hospital. Absolutely. How do people find you? Usually by the internet. Yeah? And what's, yeah. The, what's the address? How, how do they get there? Well, my, my, um, my website is Prairie Love Midwifery. And sometimes people just search Gunnison home birth or midwives near Gunnison or, mm -hmm. um, and they usually find me that way or my phone number, which will pop up on the internet as well. Marlene, thanks for the conversation. Thank you so much for having me. Think Radio is supported by the Gunnison Country Times, Gunnison, Colorado's locally owned hometown newspaper. Think Radio is a production of Alan Wardus Media. The show's executive producer is Issa Forrest. Associate producer, Kat Seibert. Original music by Issa Forrest. New episodes are available for download every Monday morning on iTunes and at alanwardusmedia.com. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Think Radio. Think Radio.